This is the build OGM call for Tuesday, September 28th, 2021. Um, Pete, so I was just sharing with Stacy that Jim Rutt uh, said yes to uh, fund OGM to uh, uh, the tune of $25,000 yesterday. And I was explaining sort of the use of funds uh, on that. And I had stuff I wanted to sort of dig into on, on that front. But I, but I was also hitting a point that I think I need to spend more time on. Um, I did one video a while back uh, called I have a hunch I'm having a unique experience here, which is the, the experience of feeding a consistent, persistent, one, a single mind map, right? Um, and, and one of the reasons I feel like the, the, the big fungus is even sort of doable uh, and not in a single tool, but one of the reasons I think it's doable and interesting and valuable is, is this curation of a single object. And I think I underestimate how little other people necessarily understand it or, or see the difference. And, and I, I feel that every time I hear people planning what to do about knowledge management or personal knowledge this or whatever, it's like, it's always little bits and snippets separately and, and, always, and always like starting from scratch. And then, and then sort of the disposability of the final image. It's not that the final image isn't, isn't woven into a useful context to return to later and make better. The final map or whatever it is, is mostly disposable. Good morning, Makatan. How are you doing? Are you warming up? Yes, uh, I'm. What did you say about the, the object? It sounded absolutely interesting. The shared object. Yeah, they're disposable. So I, I'm riffing on on the fact that I've been feeding one ma one map for 23 years, and that that's a different experience from creating disposable maps. However, however useful the maps are in the moment, uh, when you do a map and go, "That was awesome," and then put it away, um, never to return to it, even uh, in many cases, right? That's a, just a different experience. I mean, th this, this morning for some reason, oh, what provoked it? Um, uh, April and I were talking and she said the phrase one hit wonder. I'm like, oh, I think I have that in the brain. So, so in five minutes I sat down and I'm like, um, gosh, I have one trick pony, but I don't have one hit wonder. And that's all about one, right? So, uh, hold on. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> so, so in five minutes I did this. Right, so one click purchasing, the one acre fund, uh, one man plays, one punch man, the one room schoolhouse, one take one shot movies, uh, one frame cartoons, the one drop rule, you're black if you have one drop of black ancestry, that's interesting, one dimensional man uh, by Marcuse, uh, et cetera. So, so that, you know, that was five minutes of, of curating stuff that I, you know, uh, one page wonders is one pager types of website, which is under web design parallax scrolling, and has a bunch of stuff. And this experience is not normal, right? And, 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 um, and either I'm off on a fantasy trip about how interesting and useful this is, or, uh, oh, thank you, see? And if you all wanna suggest more ones, I'll make sure I either have them or add them. Um, and I, I was realizing I have to add the singularity uh, under one, because it's like everything collapses into one spot, right? Um, Monotheism. But, pardon, monotheism, very good. See, so simple. Uh, hang on. So one-stop shopping. Let's see if I have one-stop shopping. And if I don't, I add. Uh, now I have things that are one-stop shops, but I don't have one-stop shopping, so I will add it now. Um, anyway. So, so top thoughts? line, I, I see at least two things there, Jerry. One of them is uh uh curating on a topic right um and then another thing is having a persistent knowledge store that you're that's helping you curate that i it looks like you've did a lot of like there's a lot of wikipedia pages there so it looks like you did a lot of in the moment curation rather than gardening your existing knowledge base I'm um, not sure how you mean. So a lot of the pages you see here were already in my brain. Like all, all this collection right here is, is me typing one into the search bar and then yep. going, oh, that one fits. Oh, that one fits. Oh, that one fits. And finding things that were already in my, in my brain. Um, so one click purchasing can be connected to one stop shopping because they're sort of different, sort of similar, but sort of different, but they're kind of cool together. Um, monotheism, sorry. 
Can you say more about what you just said? Well, so I, I can, I, you know, I can compare and contrast with, with my experiences. And so the, um, I, th I think the thing that's different is not when you can, because I, I do something like this all the time, right? So um, huh? my, the brain is the web um, uh, instead of, uh, it's not something that I've curated. It's something that, you know, that exists to me in kind of a similar way, I think. Um, so being able to pull together a bunch of stuff is something I do all the time. Um, uh, yes, something that, yes. that I don't do all the time is have a network of a, a mind map, a connected mind map that's right. persistent over time. Right. Um, but for, for, for example, Pete, I've seen you do rapid and fabulous research on a, on a thousand topics, but those are posted to emails that disappear into the Bitbucket on a private mailing list, for example. They're not, they're not yeah. integral. You're not, well, you're, the the demonstration that you've got here, I think, is is more. It's it's fairly similar to what I do. It's not. I I don't. There, there's a uniqueness here, a, a component of uniqueness with the utility of your mind map. I think something that is a lot more like unique to you um, is when you can do a tour through the brain. This is connected to this. This is connected to this. This is connected to this. And you know, you're you're lighting up memories in your wet wet brain um, right. uh, by being able to tell a story that you own. So I don't do that. I can't do that because I don't I don't own. I you know actually related a really interesting thing. I'm using a a um, or I'm trying uh, a browser plugin that sits next to your Twitter, and it's supposed to be uh, it, it's tweet teleport or something like that it's it um it shows you related tweets to the things that you're looking at and the things that you're searching lexically uh lexically similar so mm -hmm. one of the things it does is it knows all of your past tweets so it's it's showing me stuff from you know two years ago five years ago eight years ago um and i'm like wow you know that's a really smart thing to say really 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 observant, really brilliant or something like that, you know, and it's stuff that I've, I tweets that I've written over the, over the years that I have no idea that they exist, right? And there's no, there hasn't been a good way for me to, to travel back through my history of tweets, you know, even though there's a lot of amazing stuff in there. So that's, so you, you, you are able to take those tours, you know, walk through, walk down memory lane and, it's not easy for me. I have to construct it out of Usenet posts or Usenet searches or Twitter searches or. Um, so in the early days of uh, one, one short thing and then I'll go to you, uh, Marc Antoine. Um, in the early days of the Google, I remember Doc saying that he used Google as his memory. So that mm -hmm. he was writing everything on his blog and he was an A-list blogger. So he got a lot of inbound links. So when he was thinking of something he'd written, he would just use Google and he would, his would be the first hit that showed up, but really only because he was an alias blogger. Like, oh. and so, so Google I, would have worked I, I that used way to do that. Anybody? Yeah, I used to do that all the time on, on Kaminsky Wiki. And I still do actually. If, I, if I'm looking for everything as a project, um, what I do to find it is type into Google, everything is a project, Peter Kaminsky. That's really interesting. So, but, so you all know ahead. about the site operator on Google, right? You can tell Google, yeah. look for this word on this site. Right. So, yeah, yeah. And it's absolutely worth setting that up for your own sites. So you have indexes to your writing. I, I think it's more thrilling um, when you can just search the web and find it. The, can I, or are you done? Please, please. Uh, yeah, please to you. I, I'm trying to just name what you're doing here because I find Thanks. it interesting. Uh, because there's a lot of tools that allow you to have instant web uh, web maps, right? Say what are all the like Google itself, of course, but also I'm thinking of something like Carrot that moreover does clustering. Um, and what you're doing here is kind of give me 
I'm relating by hand those sites to a concept. And this is not a sense-making map, it's a gathering map, right? But it gives me an intersection between this concept, one, and things I've already thought important. So it's a kind of intersection of my interest history and search for that concept, um, which is, as I said, very different from a sense-making map where you would say, okay, let me look at all these ones and what is the idea of oneness that may emerge out of that and let me curate a subset of that and explain why it's a relevant subset and, you know, for transmission, which is much more work. Like uh, there's all this wonderful stuff that uh, Mark Carranza does for, with a kind of brain dump uh, tool, but that is not for public consumption. And, and the, for private, you know, my own sense making versus public sense making. And in between, there's the kind of gathering before you even sense making. And gathering, are you doing it on the web or stuff you've collected or stuff you've written? And these are filters on any of those, right? Um, yeah, gathering is a... I, what I showed you right now, this one thing I did in five minutes just for kicks and it was interesting. It's not the most interesting use case here at all. This isn't just a form of gathering. It's a form of, of opinion making and framing and policy shaping. And it, it's, a, it's a consistent form of, I'm not just finding something I wrote before, Pete, which is interesting in itself. I get it. I'm but, actually- But what I'm, not, what I'm saying is yeah. you'll probably always want to go through a phase of gathering before you prune it and sense make out of oh, it. Oh, for sure, for sure. And, uh, and these are stages and they're important. You do need the gathering and yeah. you do need the, the, the pruning and you do need the, uh, shaping it for cons for external consumption. These are three stages. Right. And of all these three stages, you can apply it to the web, stuff I find interesting, stuff I've written. And these are, this is a kind of orthogonal uh, filter on these three stages. And I, I'm just trying to, as I said, name what I'm seeing. Uh, I'm not yet making a theory out of it. This is the gathering stage. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that there's something to be gained by being systematic about this because I would like to be able to say, okay, I'm uh, in the operation of pruning what I've gathered or subsetting and, 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 and how does that help me do the sense making and the packaging curating for public consumption because these are stages and they need different affordances. Yeah. Uh, and Pete, you said one thing way long ago, I think sort of near the start of OGM that I would love to have done more and I just said, haven't made a habit. But, but I think your observation was that when I'm explaining things while you're watching the brain go by, it's actually much more powerful than just trying to randomly make sense of the brain by yourself. That, that my narration and my storytelling and knowing where the skeletons are buried and what the paths are matters a lot. And I totally agree. And one thing I might have done was do a, like a video a day and just do... Yeah, so, so sit at the end of the day and reflect back on today, what was the most interesting thing that I put into my brain or ran across, and then do a two minute like screencast and just post that. Um, and I think that would be interesting because I do have a tiny habit and I don't do this often enough either. I do have a tiny habit of, of on Twitter, just posting <clears throat> a short kind of teaserish tweet with a link to one specific interesting thought in my brain. And it might be a, a, a topical thought about an event of the day. It might not, it might be just like, I love the thought isms. Right, so I think a couple times over a long period of time, I've said isms, you know, in context, and so somebody can like scroll through and go, oh my god, lots of isms. Um, but there are things that show up for me that don't show up in a Google search. I mean, I'll just I'll, I'll just give another example. Um, I, I went to Trump's favorite tactics. Here's Trump's playbook, as far as I can tell. Uh, so play dumb, uh, pay half, uh, pay half what you owe somebody, and dare them to sue. Uh, paint the worst possible picture of the president, blah, 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 uh, Darvo, dog whistle politics, uh, gaslighting, et cetera, et cetera, uh, all of which are, are tactics that other people have used, but it's kind of, I've been adding to this for a while, right? Right. Certainly since the presidency and since his candidacy, um, I don't think this thought existed. Let me just see when I put in Trump's favorite tactics, just in the chronology of, of Trump's life. 
2016, so September 2016, before he wins the election, right? I'm like, oh crap, he's doing this. Um, you break norms all the time, uh, bribe or remove representatives of the law, claim ignorance over things you know very, very well, like, oh, that man, David Duke, I don't know David Duke. Uh, anyway, the collection of these things together is different from a Google search that says, what, how does Trump do what he does? Yeah, totally. Like, and I've got another one like why people support Trump that also has links to the best articles I found about why people actually support Trump. In my, in my judgment, this is only my radar and my perspective, but this act is different from a Google search substantially for me. Yeah, I agree. And Mark Antoine curation. said it well. Yeah, yeah. curation, mm. filtering by <clears throat> what you know you know more or yes. less. And the gathering is definitely a part of it. I just, I just was complaining about the gathering because I was afraid that it was looking like the gathering was all that was that I was doing there, and that like the one was just a like a simple trivial example. It's a stage. It still kind of fun. Yeah. Anyway. It, so the <clears throat> that that Trump picture is is an interesting example for me of something that. So. So what I can take away from that, more or less, is that you know Trump has a lot of of complexity or. Um, uh, processes or something like that but there's probably something that it, it I don't know it's, it's not super interesting it's super interesting if I had time to dig into it but um, but I don't and I kind of I, I have a top level you know understanding of the Trump phenomenon and and that's kind of good enough right um, uh, unless I unless I need it deeper so the the thing that you have that the thing that you have is is kind of raw. It's uncooked, right? Um, you have a viewpoint and you have a curatorial understanding of of all of that stuff, but I don't capture that from your curation of those links. To to transmit it to, to me to help me understand what you see, you would have to tell stories through that path or write an essay about you know here's here's a here's a hypothesis or here's a, or an observation I've made about Trump and then have a through line through that, right? Um, uh, and until you narrativize it that way, um, it's not, you know, it, it's, it's raw, it's raw material. It's not, it's not cooked, it's not uh, digested, it's not sensible. So, so yes and no. I've had a bunch of people send me emails over time saying, I, I turn to your brain first when I have a new area. Who, who, who have a satisfying enough experience coming into my brain without my presence to discover a whole bunch of stuff and find useful things and, and make that a habit in their lives to start looking at my brain. So for some people, a few people, maybe this is like two, 1%, I don't know. But for some people, my brain is self-explanatory enough that they can make their way around and, don't, and they don't have to ping me and go, hey, Jerry. Um, Generally speaking, the reason I just brought it back up doing sort of screencast, narrative screencast is that what you just said is like totally like, yeah, uh, I, I need to be in there. And one thing I love to do, but is very time consuming is like the SNP series that I did <clears throat> around the global financial crisis of 2008, where I actually sat down for a couple of days, thought through the logic, did some research, collected up evidence, and then recorded three screencasts, which were in a playlist, which I can easily, I can hand somebody a link to, to the playlist on YouTube and a link to the nexus in my brain. And those two things represent a whole bunch of storytelling and a whole bunch of work and a, a big collection of articles and events and all of that. And, but, but that was a bunch of work, <clears throat> right? That represented a bunch of specific labor, but I was, but I was really interested in, this was kind of um, a prototype of, of story threading, uh, before, maybe before I was thinking of story threading in the sense of, it's my alternative explanation for why the global financial crisis happened, why we haven't dealt with it properly since then, and why it's going to, you know, things like that are going to whack us again. Um, because the, the idea that we snip long-term relationships isn't the thesis I've heard from someone else. I've heard plenty of interesting, you know, uh, ideas about why the crisis happened, but that wasn't one of them. Um, so anyway, th does that make sense? And, and, and yeah. the idea of linearizing that into a couple blog posts sort of bores me. <laughs> and, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, one of my one of my epiphanies this morning um, it, that regularly reoccurs, I think, is that um, two things um, we, we have a I'm going to say content. We have a content glut, you know, uh, telling the story of Trump even is something that we have, you know, thousands of hours worth of stuff. If, if I needed to access some of that, I could pretty easily access it. Um, and 
each of us, I think, looking at the screen, is old enough to have grown up in a era of content scarcity. Um, so, so I do this all the time, and many people I see do it all the time. It's like, oh my God, I put together this content like we like it's 1980, and you know this is so amazing and so precious and stuff like that. And it's like we're in a completely different era. You know, it's um, content is not the scarcity. It's there's a few things that are scarce for me and the few things that attract me when I'm reading Twitter, it's, it's a lot more about a novel take on something um, or somebody has made a connection that, that was not obvious to me. So those non obvious connections are the thing that are gold to me now. Um, and the ones that, you know, the, the kind of the more non obvious, but the more important, the better they are, you know, and the, I, um, I, I didn't get see a bunch of faces lighting up when I said, you know, back in the olden days, but back in the olden days, you know, really, um, uh, like a right little age. condensed, uh, condensed nugget of any content, you know, um, I probably all, each of us, you know, I used to read whatever I could, right. I would read random magazines. I would read the back of a cereal box over and over and over because it was something, right. It was content nowadays, you know, yeah, that's like, that's fly. like noise. It's it's something that you don't want. So anyway, Jerry, as you talk about, you know, how am I going to narrate through this, or the the things that are important to me out of your brain are more about novel connections and and things that I didn't think of, and not just a story because we have too many stories nowadays. Agreed. And so for me, the insight is the curated collection of links that tells a better story. Yeah, um, and I think I, I think I need to to refine it that way. Um, so um, Mark Antoine, this I, I just connected. I already had her one of her one of her great articles, so I just connected it up to the to the nexus. So I just added it to that thicket of things, so it's now built on the story, right? The the, the but it's it's interesting because one thing I'm trying to get, well, I was trying to get across is that as you curate and eliminate, and that's fine and it's important, and needs to be done. At some point, you'll want to tell a different story from the same collection. So you want to keep the collection. So right now, even making the links, you're making choices uh, and you're already pre-curating. And at some point you're like, you know what? I eliminated that, but now I realize why it's important. Uh, and so maybe you want to have the collection separate from the curated sets and have multiple curated sets as they evolve or for different audiences or as your understanding changes, you see? And, and, and this is why I'm in a single, uh, in the brain as a single graph, it's harder to do these layers. And that's something I'd like to do is being able to say, here's maybe the big curated collection because maybe it's already curated. Here's the, the web active search and I want to subscribe to that. Here's what I decided was important and an important in there. And here's what is important for a view, a curated view. And here's what's important for another curated view because I'll revisit this. So one of the really interesting things about the brain or maybe it's just how I use the brain is that those different contexts can coexist quite comfortably but not perfectly, meaning I can have a snapshot and then I can use that one of the nodes in this snapshot for a completely different snapshot or point of view or whatever. And it works, it works a bit. It certainly works if I'm narrating it because I can tell you what to ignore. But, but the overload or the overlay, I don't know exactly what this is, of the different ways of using this actually work really, really, really well. Um, and so, and, and what I'm trying to avoid is having to go to a different tool to do a particular thing. <clears throat> Although I will say that when Prezi was still Prezi before it got a lobotomy, um, I would storytell in Prezi and I would then go to Prezi and regenerate a bunch of objects that weren't linked into my brain because Prezi couldn't do that elegantly. And I would go tell a story, you know, go tell a story in Prezi. Uh, and, then, and then I would create a, I would duplicate that Prezi and then get lost because I didn't know which of, which of my many Prezi's I had a particular node in and, and I, I got the version control problem that I'm trying not to have by having more or less canonical references to the interesting uh, net nodes or nexuses uh, in this mind map. Um, so, so, 
so partly what I'm looking for in my wishful thinking about the future of what this media might look like is how do I stay, and this is what I mean by, by what is the blackboard or the background or the frame that can hold a brain display and a Kumu display and a database lookup and other things in a, in a, in a connected context that is persistent. Because otherwise I'm tool shifting to do a different, like I can't really do elegantly in the brain with what Kumu does. That doesn't work very well. But how can we get something closer than, hey, click on this link and you'll be taken over to this other random tool uh, and in a different window someplace we'll, do, you know, uh, we'll, we'll have this thing that isn't really connected back into the web. I'm really interested in, in, hey, the Kumu thing lives in the same medium, but it's a very different way of seeing what's happening in the information, right? Same thing with argumentation theory. If I wanted to be strict about, or, or speech act theory or whatever, if I wanted to be strict about those things, then there would be a, there would be a, a mini app or an internal app that would enforce the structure of that particular way of thinking or seeing or analyzing. Yep. That would then help us, help us make sense together. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, and, I don't really know what that thing is. And, and yeah, yeah. And this is what hyperknowledge is about. It's about having a common format that can express all those things in a way that enables to map those tools reactively. So something that happens in one happens in another and so forth. And, and but the problem is it will always in, involve setup because if you, for example, you're in an argument map, are all the argument links, should they induce brain links or not that automatically? So that's the question. And, and, and you have to have this idea that probably it will be uh, more suggestion, right? Uh, I've added this link in this tool. So that tool should be aware that, hey, there's a new link and maybe it should be added, maybe not. Can I ask? I'm not sure. And, and, and this is something that the tools don't know about, the, no, the notion that you're not just importing or exporting, you're maintaining a two-way sync with filtering between knowledge ecosystems and knowledge uh, lakes, if you will. That is very difficult because, and, and, and you'll want to, probably even have rules saying, oh, this kind of link, add it automatically. I don't want to bother to confirm it, but that kind of link, let me decide. And you'll have to customize the connections and so on. So yeah, no, ML, ML is anti-solution. <laughs> so, so, well, if we added some machine learning of different kinds, this gets very, very interesting. Because maybe for example, as I'm curating in whatever tool, I can say, this thing I'm looking at now, is a, is a particular kind of frame treated as something special, like like call this out as a story or a narrative or a frame or a or a conversation yep. or yep. or a claim or a claim maybe in your world, Marc Antoine, um, and, and then let it live in with the rest of the data. But 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 the system now knows that that's a different thing and can compare and contrast it with like things uh, or or something like that. I don't know. I mean, there's 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 a hundred different ways that machine learning could be useful for this co-thinking thing, you know. And that just seems like one of them. Um, Pete, let me go back to you for a sec. Um, so, uh, so I kind of have my hair on fire that we're an amnesic civilization. And that one of, one of the reasons of that is that we don't have a shared memory and that this shared memory thing is special, especially if it's durable and persistent over time. If you're feeding a long-term memory, I'm like kind of on fire about that and have been for a long time. And I don't think other people are. Um, am I like just standing with a flag in the middle of the field and, and, and this actually doesn't matter? Am I explaining it wrong? Uh, does it not matter? Like, does it matter less than I think it does? Where's that fall? Um, many of us in OGM are on fire about the idea of, of shared knowledge and shared memory and things like that. And we, we have that, you know, there, we have it in different ways. Um, we're all trying to make it better. I don't know, does that answer your question? That's kind of like a meh. Um, I mean, so, so it's not it's a- It's a, 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 a circular wholesome platitude, actually. <laughs> I love that. The curse. Uh, any, anybody else with a strong opinion about this or even a-, a I, 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 I feel like I, I, did I not get the question or did I- I think you got the question, but you're saying we all have interesting takes on this. And and to me, to me, I, I think, I think what know, I'm asking is- I, I, I spend my life, that's what I do, right? Yeah. For 20 or 30 years, that's what I've been doing. How can we not remember better? How can we, you know, I think Marc Antoine too. I think Marc Carranza too, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
and, and I think the, the, the next question, and this, oh, go ahead, Mark. No, no, just, just quickly, is this is the build OGM call. How do we make a living out of doing this? And, and I have good news on that front, which I'll come to in just a second. Uh, Mr. Carranza, and then Hank, yeah. who, raised a, who raised a pinky. Um, what was David <laughs> Christian's um, big history notion about um, uh, human civilization? It was something like accumulated knowledge. I mean, I don't think don't we're like amnesic um, civilization. We have forms of memory, but each of us basically, you know, grow from two microscopic dots that come together and we eventually become you know, semi-adults at least. Um, and, so, yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I, I would want you to qualify this notion of amnesic. I mean, we all we all start from, you know, blank slate would be the um, one of the metaphors, but certainly it's not blank. We have we have a history of evolution that goes back billions of years, but it's different kinds of knowledge. We have, in the words of the epistemolo epistemological evolutionary, we have the logic in the genes, we have the logic that's built up in the body that we can't see consciously in our immune systems and um, you know, muscle memory, these types of things. But we have a higher level, which is a symbolic um, knowledge layer. Um, that we transmit and it accumulates over time. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't have this bookshelf behind me on purpose. It's just where I have the computer. It's, it's not trying to brag or anything, but basically we have, I, I, I have a reflexive misunderstanding or, or a problem with this notion of amnesic when it comes to civilization. Um, your background, um, hey, some of this stuff is hidden on purpose. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, what does, so the question comes up, um, really what do, what do you exactly mean by this amnesia? So, um, so funny you should bring up David Christian. Um, I met him at Davos, at the World Economic Forum multiple years ago, and I listened to him talk. I was one of his audience. Then I went up and talked to him afterward, and I said, hey, interesting, beautiful, you know, very highly produced big history project. Bill Gates gave him a lot of money. So, so I said, how do I use your materials to tell a story about um, colonialism and decolonization? And he was like, he was like, he was like, well, you sort of can't. And, and he said, gosh, a lot of my historian friends are really mad at me because, because of sort of what you're saying. Like I, the Big History Project is a beautifully produced piece of knowledge of the kind that you're talking about that is hermetically sealed behind intellectual property barriers that don't let me weave it into my story and appropriate it for my own story to enhance, change, whatever, whatever, whatever. And for me, books have, are becoming an, like I call PDFs where information goes to die. I think some of us come from that world. Um, books for me are becoming little prisons of good ideas because we overprotect them and the authors overprotect them. The idea should be that the author should get a short head start. That's what the, the framers of, of you know, the, the, the original copyright clause and the statute of Anne in 1610 or 1640, 1610, I think, is the original copyright act, right? Statute of Anne under Queen Anne. Um, a, a short advantage so you can make some money. And then the idea is supposed to tumble into the commons so that we can use it, but it doesn't. And then we proceed to overprotect. Like, like I have a hard, I read a lot of books too. I like long form stuff, no big deal. I use the highlighter in the Kindle and I use the little app on the side whose name is Tiffany now, uh, read, uh, it'll come to me. Um, that, that, that sort of syncs with the Kindle notes features so that it kind of has the little clippings that I highlighted, but really not in a usable form where I can weave them in. I also don't use hypothesis, which is just not usable enough to fit into the way I work on stuff. And if I were using all those things better, they might actually sort of click together into a, a little way to use this, this, this idea, you know, this, this collected intelligence. But, but yes, we, you know, the thing we praise, the thing we love right now is books. And we think books are smart and smart people write books, but they're, they're, their ideas are imprisoned in books. And we are stupider because our ideas are being like swept out of the commons and enclosed 
and kept from us in weird ways. Like everybody's not going to read the long form book and go, oh, I remember that point. But if we could, if we could debrief them, download them, make them incredibly accessible, contextualize them, and then uh, arm equip them so that they're usable when we're sitting down to make decisions, that's really cool, right? And then I remember years ago realizing that um, for a lot of uh, uh, civic process and deliberation and rulemaking, there's like, like this 90 minute period for, for public comment during which you could convene a panel. And you basically, you would have to, so you had to, for the process, you had to create a report on the topic. So you had to hire somebody to write a report, which was just a report in a capsule. You had to train up a bunch of citizens on this one issue, and then they had to make a decision. And then that one little decision sort of made its way back to legislators in this, in this sort of way that civic process was supposed to work. And I'm like, that's just an asinine waste of time. Like, like issues like zoning and watersheds and all that are, are woven into the world all the time. There's no reason to write a new thing. You can have different points of view on these things. How do we how do we change public discourse so that we can make better, more informed, deeper decisions constantly and consistently and learn from what that town over there did and share it with this town over here? Instead, we're busy like replicating all of this over and over again in little tiny instances that are cut from the herd. And I'm, know, making, I'm making a lot of big sweeping statements, but I feel really strongly yeah, about this. That, that waste of time statement, you know, basically deliberative democracy. Um, and hey, let's cut through the bullshit. Um, whoa, I'm kind of like, I don't, I don't know about that. Um, what, part, what part don't you know about? Sorry. Uh, making a report, you know, thinking before acting. I don't mean that. I don't mean that it's fruitless. I mean that it's a whole lot of effort in a little capsule of time for information that gets lost and cut away that nobody else knows about. David Galenter had um, a pre-web book. Um, what the heck was it? Um, Mirror Worlds. Yeah. And so basically when when everything gets modeled um, and we can all see it and it's all transparent and, and basically we can use this live um, uh, compiled information that's assembled for us automatically by algorithms and it becomes the um nervous system that we all can personally and collectively tap into of societal um flows of of, of sensor sensory information that's generated automatically about our society how many stoplights are broken how many hospitals have beds in them uh that uh, can handle a certain type of um treatment um I'm 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 simply ooh, reminded that when I use my Memex or Pan Sophia, um, basically I'm using it for many different things. I'm using it for therapeutic reasons. Um, why am I feeling this way this morning? Okay, I'm gonna go inspect that. Um, uh, why do Mark, Antoine, and I not really understand each other completely as I thought we would? Okay, I'm going to like try to figure out that. Um, how can I work more with Pete Kaminsky? Because Pete Kaminsky is cool. And, you know, why, why, why isn't Stacy saying anything? You know, I am, I am, you know, not only looking at um, the ideas of uh, Plato and you know, the, the morning paper and the I Ching and, you know, what I ate last night, but there are so many different use cases. Um, it comes into what I just heard from Nora Bateson, kind of like a, a hyper contextuality or a, a trans contextuality, a multiple contextuality. I don't talking about warm data. Is that the parts that you're thinking about? Um, well, I, I have, have, if you have a, like a multiple context thing from her, um, no, I don't I don't, see I don't, I don't have hyper contextuality. Yeah, I've got, so, I've got, well, warm data is contextual relational interaction. So it is contextual. It, it is, but basically I need to get to Mark Antoine and a number of friends of mine. Her talk at the 2021 20, uh, biosemiotics gathering. Uh -huh. um, which uh, is absolutely brilliant. So I will try to find that 
and post it in the chat. And please, uh, thank you. Um, but but basically, um, boy, are there taxonomies of many different things and many different contexts for the use of your brain. And have you got that kind of taxonomy of your own behavior? Because I can almost guarantee that you use this thing differently in different use cases. Of course, I, I just said I do. I'm sorry? I just said that I, 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 I it's multi-contextual, multi, -contextual, multi um, it's, it's a, I use it many different ways and they all happen to sort of work because the tool is kind of thin enough or skinny enough. It does only a few things that really matter to me and mm -hmm. the rest, I, the rest I'm kind of layering on and that's really useful to me. It's not, it's not a dedicated special purpose tool, sort of like Kumu seems to be to me. So basically Mark, Peter, um, who I've heard talk so far on this and, and Jerry, of course, but certainly not putting off Hank or Stacy, and I'll let Hank go next very, very quickly. But a trying to get a list of these use cases has been tricky for me. And um, because it's these multiple contexts. Thanks, Hank. Uh, yeah, the world is drowning in information is drowning in knowledge is drowning in fake knowledge is drowning in data there's very little wisdom and without trying to say that jerry's brain is wisdom or wikipedia is wisdom it's not it's just ways that people can access things that are important to them so that with deep reflection or collaborative deep reflection, maybe they will get some wisdom out of it. So you said a few minutes ago, Jerry, it's a curated collection of links uh, that's important. And then a few minutes after that, you wondered out loud if you were standing alone in an empty field waving a flag. I got the image of uh, 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 Mephisto, the film Mephisto, you know it. Uh, I don't know the scene. Uh, where, the, uh, where the director who collaborates with, uh, with Hitler is on an empty stage looking up at, this, at the ceiling and saying, yes, but I'm just doing my thing. Well, uh, that's not exactly the quote, but that's, that's more or less the feeling of it. Yesterday in the conversation, you said something that had made me think all evening and all this morning. Uh, what you said, uh, smart people helping to collect, digest, translate, synthesize each other's ideas is doing the work of the world. And I think that this type of thing that we're talking about here, we're talking about in, in Free Jerry's Brain, in this building OGM call, is the work of the world. And it's the kind of stuff that's especially suited to the people on this call and probably to others in, in OGM. And it doesn't matter if you're alone, <laughs> alone in the field waving a flag, you know, as, Somebody's got to do it. Someone's got to wave the first flag. Uh, yeah, I think you, if putting out a form of Jerry's brain in a more accessible way, so that as we often have been calling people like me, uh, if the muggles, the non IT people could really use it and access it and say, wow, I never saw those things fitting together. Why do they fit together? And sit down and think about it in the dinner table, talk to their children about it. You're really doing the world a service. Anyway, that's, that's how I see it. Thank you, Hank. And I, I really agree with that. And I, I, want, I want to do something so interesting and attractive that people will take the energy they're spending memorizing baseball stats. Like a lot of people that don't look intelligent are actually really, really smart. You just have to scratch until you uncover the thing that they're really smart about. And it might be like 
uh, they can memorize a quilt pattern to 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 the point where they don't look at instructions and like produce an, an entire beautiful work. It may I don't know what it is, right? But people are like the brains are, are working. It's just that we've made a world where when they try to apply it to make sense of the world, there's too many notes uh, and it doesn't really work. And civic participation seems to be a, a bit of a dead end, and it just gets you in trouble and maybe physically hurt, and a bunch of other bad stuff is happening. So how do we create a shared artifact that is fun, fun? to curate that is meaningful to curate so that it leads to better decisions. And so that we can like lather, rinse, improve. And it has to let each of us create our own uh, point of view inside of it and then make room for this, you know, shared insights in some way. And I don't, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but I, th I think it is like really important. I think that, 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 that this shared artifact that, in, that embodies, okay, so this appears to be a claim, which is a speech act what is the underlying logic and what are the premises that, that reinforce this claim? And then, and then wiggle down that chain of logic that Marc Antoine's software will have put next to us so that we can start to go, oh, okay, it seems to rely on these four, four pieces of evidence or, or reasoning. Do I agree with them? And do you? And let's keep going. And not that we're gonna do that for everything we say and, 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 and claim, but that having this at hand will actually like really improve things. Um, Mark, thank you for finding the video. I, I did a search on, on YouTube for uh, Bateson and speech title, and that didn't actually um, work for me, but you found it. Cool. Uh, Hank, then Mark. Oh, I, I have to take my, sorry. Uh, Hank. Uh, well, I've got the floor. Thanks for your okay, good. quotes from uh, Mephisto. Uh, I only had the paraphrase, but that's the real quote. And it's very powerful. It's a very powerful ending. Love that. Thank you. Uh, and Mark, did you want to jump in? So, so boy, have I been thinking about this. Um, and it really helps to talk about it because it's very, very difficult. Um, and These calls are the talking cure. Sure. <laughs> And again, basically two weeks ago on, I forget if it was a Bill OGM call or a Generative Commons call, you and Pete had, had it back and forth. It's like, oh, this is brilliant. I, I, I wouldn't have gotten these ideas if I hadn't watched the video, gone back and you know, watched the video. Something I didn't attend. Now, my... I have a I have a story. It's a bad story. It's a fake story. It's a story that um, is made up and is probably untrue. That story is: I need about a thousand hours of talking to figure this out, so that I can write it down, write a spec, and do about two thousand hours of coding to get exactly what you asked for. But. Um, you know, based on where I'm coming from. I tried to do that with Mark Perron. I've tried to do that with you a couple times, Jerry. And there's a impedance mismatch. Um, it's it's fascinating. It's cool. It's, go ahead. So Mark, when you're using your tool, mm -hmm. it's making sense to you in a way that I don't understand. I it's can't see, I cannot see it. I cannot grasp it. I see that there's a bunch of stuff around a timestamp. I see it's a little bit like backlinks in Rome or whatever, but not quite like backlinks in Rome. And I, I see numbers that mean nothing next to phrases that are repeated a lot. And it's all in one long four. And it doesn't, it doesn't, in my mind, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't re, it doesn't remap itself. You know how data sometimes lies in, in funny shapes and then gets instantiated in some visualization, right? Like the brain is tuples and suddenly like it's a thing on screen. Uh, the brain's thing on screen really works for me. And I realize I'm probably a couple of sigmas off the mean here. Um, but, but when you, whenever you're, even when you screen shared the other day, like I was like, I just don't see it. And, and it's, it's music to you and you're doing art and data together, which is fabulous. And I'd love to get to the point where what you've built actually is useful for me. Mm -hmm. I would love to get to the point. I don't see it. And so I need a thousand hours of talking and two thousand hours of coding to get there. <laughs> or, or ex externalize your data, say a lot about what you mean, and crowdsource somebody else to come up with the results because you may not be the guy who shows up and figures out what those connections are and how to see them. 
what I'm attempting to do is basically go through the path of science, semiotics, to basically say, aha, here's the iconic level of digital, where, where language meets digital. Here's the indexical level of where language meets digital. Uh, I know we can't get to the symbolic because that's not what computers can do. But as an aid to symbolic processing in the human mind, um, what is the simplest possible way to store um, some notes and basically, you know, to store it, it's just type something, which is the focal, um, uh, what does Michael Simonyi call it? The focal attention. Right now my focal attention is on Jerry or it's on Stacy. And the subsidiary attention is on uh, Jerry's background or Stacy's background or how Stacy is in a um, box underneath uh, Peter and for me to the um, right of Hank. You know, there's there are these relations that happen in the world that can be noticed. Um, yes, but focal and subsidiary attention. So I am not where, or, or, you know, the, the, what I'm trying to do is the foundation that can get from what I'm doing to where you are taking the information that's stored in the exact way that can be eventually made into what works for you as a visual map with consistent semantics, consistent visual idioms. You have the people to the upper right, you have the subset below, you have the superset above, you have miscellaneous to the left, or something that is worked out by um, another person in their own visual mapping, um, gathering, chunking sense. Um, so boy, do I understand that it's my fault. Well, yeah, let, let me just go there. It's my fault that people don't understand what I'm doing. Very clear about that. And happy, happy to raise my hand and say, yeah, boy, am I trying. It's, it's, it's really, really difficult. People who I think can really understand, it's like, oh, wow, I got to do all this work before. Sorry, Mark Antoine. Mark Antoine gets what I'm saying because he's not getting it. And, you know, no, no skin off of Mark Antoine. Um, he's incredibly smart and he's got his own level where he looks at concepts. And I'm saying, no, 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 look down here. Look, well, don't look down here exactly, but, but you know, really, really low in, in this. Um, I think I'm looking, I think I'm looking quite low actually. You're not. You're yeah, not. yeah. So, so two things, uh, two things. One of which is I wanna tell you some good news before we run out completely out of time. Um, but Mark, it occurs to me that you and I are doing remarkably similar things day to day for a long period of time. Here's the two places I think that they vary. I have a different set of choices about what I put in my brain than you do in what you put in MX, right? So we, we, we are, are the curation of chunk and chunk size and chunk framing is different. Your, your chunks are more like note taking and stream of consciousness. My chunks are more like, oh, this stands out, it's memorable, or it's the title of a work or the name of a, of, a, of a noun or whatever, right? And then the second thing is, the only feature I really use out of the brain is up, down, left. And, and I make it mean meaningful things to me at every point in the, uh, along the journey. So that, that the left isn't miscellaneous, the left is antonyms or it's tight couplings, or it's like, like the jump thought, if, if the brain didn't have this weird little jump thought thing, it would be much weaker for me semantically. It would like, like I would lose some aspect of what I love about its expressive capacity. I don't use any of its advanced features. I don't use link types, thought types, labels, tags, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. I, I use none of that. So, so all that can be chucked overboard and I would, not, I would not lose a moment's sleep. So I'm not doing a lot more than you are, but the little bit of, of context that I'm adding and the little bit of editorial that I'm adding makes the brain work like super duper duper well for me and a couple other people in the world. And I'm trying to look at what you're doing because I realized that we're like so close, but, but your system lacks so much context for me that I can't actually make any sense of it. Like, like, like MX, 
doesn't have any added layer of semantics that helps a non note taker who did the original note taking make sense of it. And if it did, it could be incredibly powerful. And I don't exactly know how to manifest it. And I'm not saying it should look like the brain. I'm just saying that the brain ain't that much more different than what you're doing. Does that make sense to you? Cool. Let me take, before we run, we're almost at our hour. I just want to say like a, a couple of you know, so actually really good news. Uh, yesterday, I've been, in a, I've been in a casual conversation with Jim Rutt, who is kind of the center of the game B movement and who back in the dot-com era was the CEO of Network Solutions, which was an important infrastructure player. <clears throat> and on the day of the dot-com disaster, he closed the deal selling NetSol to VeriSign uh, and walked away with a good payout. And since then has been doing interesting things, including this game B thing. Um, and so, yes, we've been having casual calls because we're each sort of interesting to the other. Um, and in a call last week, he was like, you know, and, and I was describing OGM and its needs for some funding. And he said, you know, uh, today I sent a note saying no thank you to a, an org who I thought we were going to invest in. So we have a little bit of spare cash in the family foundation. Um, so I wrote a proposal and yesterday we talked at noon and he made some, we sort of refined a piece of the proposal and he said, yes. And he's basically sending $25,000 over into OGM to do something with. And I, I have a use of funds in the proposal and, and all of that. A piece of it comes to me, a piece of it goes to people who are going to edit. Uh, we're going to stand up Weaving the World as, a, as both a video podcast and an audio podcast through probably anchor.fm. Uh, and then I'm going to curate just in the brain because he was like, specifically, what happens now? And I'm like, I'm, I do this thing in the brain. So he's like, great, that's exactly what I want. So I'm going to curate each episode uh, before, during, and after, and then a brain, sort of hopefully recruit other people to join in with other tools and other means to sort of start to, to start uh, seeding the fungus, the big fungus. And he's like, fungus? And I'm like, yep, the big fungus. And so he, he's on board. Uh, and, and, and I think very importantly, in the context of Build OGM, a piece of that money is to create, to start two projects, which I would describe here as tiles in the big mosaic. Uh, I'd like to fund two smallish projects that are software projects that will put some pieces in place for the, the, the bigger thing, for the bigger vision we're heading toward. So I, I, I'm like trying to figure out what is a bite-sized proposal that fits into the larger map of where we're all kind of heading. Uh, what is like a double word tile uh, that, we can, that, that we can bake into this? Um, and I've got, I now have some funds that whoever wants to build it and do it could collect. Um, so I'd love to do that. And I, I would love your, your fertile imaginations on this and all feedback and ideas and everything else. Congratulations, Jay. Good Thank you. It's, uh, it's not a lot of money, but it's actually, it's actually directionally perfect. Like, and he, like it's, and it sprang out of a conversation where I had no, I wasn't pitching him. He, he, I, he wasn't on my sort of list as a potential funder, but he has funds and, and it just sort of emerged organically in like the, ni the nicest, nicest way. Um, and so now I can sort of go walk to other people and say, hey, Jim Rudd did this, are you interested? It gives, me a, it gives me a place to go talk to more people and it gives me some stuff to stand up and just go do uh, really quickly now. Jerry, you're standing in the field, you waved your flag. And it just proves, build the field, they will come. And That's if right. they use it, it will build itself. All I need is a baseball team to show up now. <laughs> I thought you, you've got one here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There is well, a baseball 27 team. 27 of us. Yeah, I love it. Mark, go ahead. A point of order, please. Um, yes. I uh, wasn't able to save the chat from uh, the uh, last uh, call yesterday because it went, uh, everybody said goodbye and boom, it, it evaporated way too quickly. So um, I just saved the chat, um, but a little warning um, if we can remember at the end of a uh, talk. Oh, cool. So I've been, we've totally broken discipline with using Mattermost for our chats. Uh, it's just a wee bit too complicated to manage two chats and then, and, and so forth. I have been, but not consistently taking the chats and posting them to the channels for the appropriate calls. So you'll see on on uh, yesterday, well, wh whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm often, but not always posting the Jay's, Jay's good about making recordings. And when you make a recording, you get a, a chat too. Yeah, the chat- but We've the got chat all those chats. The chat shows up from Zoom. I have all the chats. So, so I've got them. I don't have a consistent habit of posting them to uh, the Mattermost chats, which would be one place to put them. Um, I also, it's, it's extra work to separate out the, 
uh, and I don't get transcripts for all the calls. I get transcripts only for the Thursday calls, but those are useful. And I don't have the, ha it takes extra work to actually remember where they go and move them around. So I don't do that habitually. If, if I had a couple of macros and pipes, I think that would be easily fixed. Or an intern. Or yes, or an intern. And part of what Jim offered was his assistant to do some, some wrangling. And uh, he also has some staff that edit his podcast. He has, the, he has two podcasts, the Jim Rutt Show and another one uh, that's more casual. Uh, and the Jim Rutt Show is, is held up to a pretty high level of podcast production and has a whole bunch of people you know, listening to it and so forth. So you know, he's, he's very experienced in, in that world, uh, for example. Is we should make for, for uh, uh, the FGB calls. We should um, make what? There's no, that as quick question, sorry, yes. Peter. Is there a location for the, the um, FGB calls? The free there's, a, there's a private channel on Mattermost for FGB. So I post them in there. Please invite. And if you're not in, we'll invite you in right now. Yeah, thank you. Um, Pete? Uh, we should make a Airtable or a Wiki or, or a Trove uh, Annex or, or something, probably all three of those. Uh, and, and, and a Git repo, I guess a, a wiki is a Git repo. Um, but we should have one place where you just, you know, you can find all the, the, the video links and all the, the chats. What I'd love is to drop them in one place where they're gonna be stored permanently. And then to have every time there's a new drop to have a script that basically says, oh, I know what to do with a new drop, zip, 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 zip. And I need to figure out what those steps are and where you know where to put what. I, I uh, actually want to build that uh, as as a service. Um, uh, it that would also could, do uh, transcripts and stuff like that. That might actually be a tile piece, Pete. And if you want to frame that up as a project, because I've heard somewhere that everything is a project, and that seems like that seems like a simple project that would actually help a shit ton. I believe that's a term of art. Um, so yeah. There's a dimension of that that I'm extremely interested in. Uh, having, I agree, having a, it's like an RSS feed, but it's interesting because the entries are like ICS, their calendar, and they get modified after the fact because you're adding the extra information. Here's the transcript, here's this, here's that. The other thing I'm really, I've used in Idealoom and I would like to kind of extract from there is all these chats uh, having, here's a chat and here's segments like a post, post hoc threads. Like uh, most people now use linear systems which don't give you threading. And can we reconstitute the threads after the fact? Um, I just saw a new feature on YouTube called Clips. It just like came by the screen and I haven't used it, but it appears that YouTube has gotten smart and made it easy to, to point people to a segment not just a starting point, because you know, you've been able to do t equals number of seconds in for a long, long time. But now I think clips are working, which is, might be very, very useful as an affordance. Sorry, Mark, go ahead. I work at a place that will store anything digital forever for free. I've heard of this. In yeah. fact, in fact, the, in, in fact the only place that my old podcast, the Yitan Weekly Technology yeah. Call, the only place that exists in the world right now is in the archive because I hired a, a Lithuanian who was basically doing some post processing for me for the nine years I did the podcast. And one of his tasks was to make sure every episode was in the archive. And we don't have enough Lithuanians. We have a shortage of Lithuanians. Yeah, maybe we can fix that. <laughs> and, but, but getting to stuff in the archive um, boy, is that um, is that difficult? I, I I I have the dream that a whole bunch of people will basically guerrilla attack the archive. They will store stuff, and they will basically create a new interface to get to their stuff. Um, I would I would love that because, for example. There's no way that I found, and I didn't try hard in the archives for me to reconstitute my old podcast. I can do a, I can do a search on the archive on the, the keyword yitan, which should be pretty rare, like yi hyphen tan should be like a pretty unique string. It coughs up some of the episodes, not a lot, I don't know, not in any good order, nothing, nothing, nothing. It would be super cool to have some kind of overlay context that says, oh, here's what that entity actually was. And in fact, it's missing a couple episodes. Anybody have these? you know, whatever, that, that'd be really awesome among, among many other things. And, and I think that's a super interesting conversation to have 
um, with you in the archive. Uh, any other thoughts? I'm um, a bit curious about how the archive, I know it interacts a lot with the D-Web. Uh, I would like to have details about that. Oh, uh, there is a D-Web um, yeah, yeah, happening two hours from now that we're going to be on. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. So oh, we'll God. see you shortly, I guess. Um, Stacy, you know, you know, uh, Jim, uh, uh, and uh, any thoughts? J any thoughts about Jim Rutt? Yeah, or about just this conversation in general. Um, well, Jim, um, yeah, I, I know Jim Rutt from Game Bay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, his philosophy is, you know, in alignment with what I think most of the people here think. Um, as far as the overall conversation, it was just, you know, Mark mentioned how silent I was. <laughs> I'm just drinking everything in and wondering if the thoughts I'm having in my head even relate to what's going on. So yeah, I'm just gonna stay quiet, I think. <laughs> well, if, if the thoughts are stimulated by the conversation we're having, they do relate in some in some sense. And it would be really fun to sort of follow the threads and the, to figure out how, you know, how that works. And, and I think there's an interesting, there's an interesting exercise that's a little bit out of reach for us, but it, uh, like you just sort of kind of planted it in my head, which is, okay, let's say there's an episode or an event how do we get a bunch of people um, who are just sort of in the audience to report in what this, you know, what sparks it lights up for them in their, in their heads, what questions they come up, like, how do we, how do we derive some of the, the byproduct thinking from a particular conversation? And then for some of them, how does that weave into the, the larger question? Because, because a really important aspect of all of this is not to, uh, like one of the problem with the postmodernists is that they dissolved into a self-referential crowd of people who were saying like really smart things. They were like the postmodernists, if you go back and look at them and they're almost unreadable, but if you go back and look at what they were saying, they were like totally dead on with their critiques of consumerism and blah, 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 blah. They predicted sort of the World Wide web and all that, but they were incomprehensible to a normal citizen, incomprehensible. And we don't so want to dissolve into that. We want to be more comprehensible to, to normal people. So I guess that sort of does tie into what I've been thinking, because like when Mark was talking and describing my, where my position was, I was thinking, well, that's not the way I'm seeing it. And um, I got um, an email from this friend that I've mentioned before that I'm kind of estranged from. And um, it was from David Ick or, you know, and, uh, you know, he's a well-known conspiracy theorist and also known to be an anti-Semite. And um, so at first I just rejected the whole thing. And then I said, you know what, let me just listen to what he's saying. Now, I don't often talk about like my spirituality or my views on consciousness here, but that's a very big part of where my attention is. And um, listening to him, I agree with everything he's saying. However, I fully disagree with the where he's directing the energy. Like he talks about um, all these psychopaths that are in the world that I totally agree with, but then he calls Fauci and um, Gates a psychopath and not one mention of Trump. And my, my, for me, he's another snake oil salesman, but his message, if I took it out of, con you know, if I took away all of the identifying features, I can agree with that. So I guess where my thoughts are is that we're never getting the whole picture or the picture from the same point of view. And that's what I was thinking through this call and I'm not really sure how it fits in or matches. As far as I'm concerned, that's totally related to what we're saying here. Like, like it really fits in nicely in, in that um, one of our concerns is how to absorb, mirror, reflect, represent, and then talk through conflicting points of view about stuff. And, you know, one of the reasons Trump got really popular was that there's a grain of truth behind a bunch of stuff that he says. Um, you know, he was one of the few politicians who were like busy saying George W. Bush had no business taking us into the Iraq war. The Iraq war was stupid. There's no Republicans. I don't know of any Republicans who said, who said that, maybe one or two, but nobody. 
And that, that's completely true. We had no business spending all that money and treasure and human lives in Iraq and, and destroying this country that didn't attack us. Nobody else was saying that. And, and there's a bunch of things like this, right? Uh, and, then, and then also behind most stereotypes and most biases, there are grains of truth. Um, uh, Polish immigrants to the US were mostly uh, illiterate peasants from the countryside. So the Polak stereotype is like the dumb Polak, you know? And, and there's a grain of truth in there because this wasn't, this, this wasn't university trained PhD immigrants. Uh, th this was people who'd been like digging potatoes out of the soil and then showed up here and said, how do I work? Okay, so how do we, how do we sort that out and how do we make that work properly? And the only other thing that I think about is the element of time. Um, when you're bringing in the information, what's the context at that time? And also um, the, the thing I thought you meant, but I agree with what you just said as well, is the effects of, of uh, relationships over time, the building of trust over time, the evolution of perspectives over time, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Like time is a huge and interesting variable here. Um, sweet, thank you, appreciate that. Uh, anything else before we wrap this call? See a couple of you on the, on the meetup, on the DWeb meetup. Thank you.